Well, greetings, everybody. The clock is striking noon here in Chicago, and there's catchy theme music playing. I don't know if that's catchy or just tacky, uh, which means it's time for yet another fall publishing webinar. I'm Chris Bates, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we tackle today's topic. You're looking at it, at it right there. Create colorful fall landscapes with pansies, perennials, and mums. Now, if you're a grower or landscaper looking to spice up your fall business, uh, you're going to find some ideas here in all those crop categories. Uh, now, as usual, I'm not the expert on the topic. One of these days, I've got to do a webinar where I'm the expert, but, well, we have a long way. Uh, it'd be on carpentry or guitars or something. Uh, but who is? Well, today we've got not one, not two, but three experts. First, the lo lovely Lindsay Eastman from Loma Vista Nursery. Lindsay, are you there? Hi, Chris. Hey, so where, where is Lin uh, 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 Loma Vista Nursery? We're just about 40 miles south of downtown Kansas City. Kansas City. Uh, Ottawa, Kansas. It, so it sounds more like a place on coastal California. Loma Vista means what in Spanish? It means the view, uh, view from the hill. And oh. um, interesting that you mentioned that our company was actually started in Southern California. And then um, when my family decided to move to the Midwest, my father started another nursery in Kansas and kept the same name. Well, how do you like that? I thought it was maybe view of, view of the loam pile. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, uh, I, and I don't have to ask where my next two guests are sitting because uh, they're crammed in right next to me uh, in my palatial office. They are Linda Castellas and Jeff Gibson. Welcome, guys. Well, thank, thank you. you. All right. Now, Linda, you're a supply chain manager for, for, ball. All, for, for, ball, for all chrysanthemums. Well, I'm the business manager for all chrysanthemums, supply chain manager for the West Coast. Okay, but today we're talking, today we're talking garden mums. Mom. Well, garden, garden yeah. mums. There you go. All right, and you're gonna you're gonna introduce some of the uh, the ball varieties to us and some tips and tricks. And Jeff, my friend, you're the ball landscape business manager, and everybody wants to know what in the world does that mean? Yes, sir, I am. Thanks, Chris. I, uh, as the title implies. The business management of landscape. So as I am often telling people, it's essentially connecting the growers that Ball sells to with the landscape customers that are their customers and vice versa. And you so know what? I spend a lot of time on both sides. You know what I forgot to do? I was so wrapped up in communicating. I forgot to show everybody's picture here. So there's, a, there's Lindsay from Loma Vista. And uh, there's Linda. And... Uh, there's good old Jeff out in the ball landscape, and I should have gotten a picture of all three of us here in the palatial uh, ball publishing broadcast studios. If you could picture that spot and now three heads in there instead of just the one of us, you'll get an idea of what we're doing. So um, now, um, and I'm your host, Chris Bates. You know me. Um, now, a note: usually by this point in the uh, the webinar, I'm getting some private messages saying I can't hear, and it's because usually. Uh, it's something uh, setting on your end of things. So if you can't hear, well, you can't hear me right now. But if you can read, <laughs> this is what those folks who can't hear need to do to make sure they can hear. But so far, I don't have anybody saying I can't hear. So that's a that's a good thing. Uh, you just have to click on the right links. But you guys got that figured out. Now, uh, if you have questions as we go along, use the um, uh, the little chat area you see on the side. That's the easiest one from my perspective to follow what's going on. Uh, Neil has already sent a little thing. Yes, Neil, the webinar started. Um, and, just, and we will get to those questions as we go along, if they pertain to the topic at hand. Otherwise, we'll kind of save them for the end. And if we just can't get to your question and it's burning, well, I'm going to give you a, an email uh, at the end where you can reach our speakers. Uh, and if something comes up where you have to leave the webinar partway through, uh, well, gosh, that'll be a shame. However, fear not, it will be archived at the same place you registered fallpublishing.com slash webinars. We'll give you this one again at the end as well. So I think that is all of the uh, the housekeeping I need to do. Lindsay, are you all set? I believe so. All right. Well, you better be because you're up. <laughs> Tell okay, us a little bit about start. yourself here, Lindsay. Go for it. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Lindsay Eastman. I'm the general manager of Loma Vista Nursery. Uh, we started in the Kansas City Metro in 1991 as a grower slash re-wholesaler, and we service only landscape contractors, so we grew and re on the same property. 
Um, and as that kind of evolved, we opened a, a secondary facility to just focus on growing, which was 80 acres in Olathe, Kansas. Um, but the town kind of engulfed us. So 10 years ago, we moved 40 miles south of town to Ottawa, Kansas. Um, and that's our current site where we have a 330 acre facility. Um, and in 2013, just a short time ago, we opened our second landscape distribution center facility uh, in North Kansas City. Uh, so here's a picture of our container production. Um, we have a propagation division, which is kind of what we call the lifeline of our entire nursery. We like to do most of our propagation in-house so we can control our supply and have our, have our timing when we want it. Um, so we propagate about 1.1 million plants annually. We also are doing most of our perennial production from unrooted cuttings, about 500,000 annually. And um, our propagation division is responsible for providing close to 90% of all the liners that we use at the nursery. And here's just some more pictures so you can kind of get a feel of the site. Uh, there's about 120 acres in production. Uh, the reason we moved to Ottawa, Kansas, so far out of town, is because the site we are on is a former rock quarry. It has a 65-acre lake with average depth of 85 feet. So um, we look into the future for water supply. That was really important. We target to have about 750,000 to 1 million sellable plants on the ground. And um, in perennials, we're focusing on quarts, one gallons, and two gallons. Although we did just start a three-gallon hosta program at the um, request of a few of our customers. Uh, then we do a lot of shrub production to grasses, roses, evergreens, woodies, and pot and pot tree production up to 30 gallon for landscape size. That's a picture of two two of our distribution facilities. Um, there we also do hardscape supply and bulk material supply. Uh, so Chris had asked that I talk about some of the trends that we were, we're seeing from our side as growers and uh, suppliers to landscape customers of perennials. So number one, big one, and it's um, not new to 2016, but it's definitely a continuing trend is the use of natives, uh, especially on the specification for commercial jobs. There are a lot of uh, municipalities that are requiring natives for lead projects or have bioswell requirements that use a lot of native plant material, uh, specifically grasses and perennials. So that's been a shift in our product mix to be able to supply some of those. Um, second is the mix of natives and cultivars and mass plantings. We're seeing a lot more of that. In the past, we saw designers using only natives or only cultivars, and now we're mixing them, which I think is a very nice balance because we can get um, lots of cultivars that we know perform really well in our area, and also the natives that do do the good jobs for us as far as um, in, in um, different bioswell areas and different areas of the property for um, for landscape. Third one, which is was new for me this year, especially being in Kansas City in the Midwest, was the use of succulents in landscape. We've always used lots of sedums, but past that, we haven't seen a lot of other succulents being used because we have um, pretty heavy soil and um, not a very arid climate where is where you normally see the succulents. So. We actually did several contract grows this year for succulents that were planted in mass plantings in the landscape. Um, so I'll be interested to see how those turn out and we'll go look at them in a few years from now. Uh, use of pollinator friendly varieties, that's been a hot trend for this year. Um, probably everybody is familiar with millionpollinators.org. Um, if you're not, I would definitely check that out because it's a really great opportunity for anybody that's um, in the perennial or landscape business to um, help others uh, plant plant more perennials, and then uh, expanding cultivar cultivar options of popular uh, popular tried and true varieties. And that's for me as a as a grower and a distributor. What we're most um, excited about, as far as the trends, is getting people to uh, break away from tradition and use something that's actually better and actually going to give them a better result. And then a few tips for fall planted perennials, and I won't spend too much time here, but um, number one key to having a great looking fall landscape is to plan for fall in the spring or whenever you're installing. And a lot of times on the wholesale side, we'll see people, uh, contractors come in with their customer and their customer picks out everything that's blooming right now in May. And um, 
that's not going to be the best landscape for them when they're sitting out on their patio within their fire pit in the fall, um, everything bloomed out. So really looking at plants with three or four seasons of interest or making sure that we do a mix of the four seasons throughout the landscape is really important. Um, fall is the best time to clean up or divide varieties. Um, and um, in the fall, we do have to be mindful of the weather in the Midwest. If we're going to get early cold weather, just need to be careful. Um, and then the main thing for us in the fall is planting in the Midwest, and it might not be this way everywhere in the country, is I, I put go big or go home. So basically, plant one gallons or plant bigger perennials in the fall so we don't have the freeze thaw issues. Kansas City, uh, we're notorious for a winter drought. So when you get winter drought on fall planted perennials, um, you have very high mortality. And you can start with a little bit larger size, you can be more successful. So some of the fall perennial favorites, and some of these are going to be ones that maybe you've been using forever. Some of them are maybe older varieties that are a little bit overlooked. The first one I have on here is Hardy Plumbago. This is a zone five ground cover. It can take full sun to part shade. It has a tremendous fall color. I don't have a picture of the fall color there, but I do have a picture of the late summer to fall flower, which is a really intense blue. Another ground cover is Lismachia Goldie. It has three seasons of interest. You see that in mixed in with annual plantings and uh, perennial plantings. So it's a good crossover that we can use in containers and we can use it in the landscape and we can use it year round, but it's gonna still look good in the fall no matter when you plant it. Um, variety that we're super excited about from a production standpoint and from a um, uh, landscape standpoint is the Carnival series of coral bells. This is a really heat tolerant series because it's crossed with a Velosa and it comes in a lot of great colors. It's a part shade to full shade. And I would say that you can get away with more sun on this than some of the other series I've seen. Uh, we actually have successfully planted this in full sun and it still looks good through the whole season here in Kansas City. And let's go to the next slide here. Uh, this is just some pictures of it in production. So we really like this series because it uh, it makes a nice clean container look too. So on the left is the coffee bean. Um, it's pretty comparable to Caramel, which is a hot variety as well. To both of them and the landscapers are really liking the coffee bean because it's pretty vigorous. Uh, top left is peach parfait, right is rose granita, and the bottom is watermelon. Um, and the bottom. Oh. Okay, I didn't write down the bottom one, but it'll be right here on this slide. So here's the whole series. So it's kind of exciting to have a whole series of really drought tolerant, um, can stand up to heat, can stand up to humidity, and still look good from spring to fall coral bells. Um, they're not burning out in the center. Uh, here's an example of we mixed some fall mums with the money wart, uh, gold, the golden money wart and the coral bells. So that's an option. And when those fill out, the coral bells look really nice mixed in there. Okay, the next uh, plant that we're super excited about is coral bells, is a home flower. So on the bottom left is sombrero blanco. Uh, sombrero blanco is part of the sombrero series, which is from ball. And then in the, uh, on the right, I have Palo Alto Wild Berry, and the bottom is Magnus. And if you want to go to the next slide, I'll kind of get into those a little bit more. So I don't know if anybody else has been burnt by any of the hot colored coral uh, home flowers, but in the past, we have high demand for we need a yellow, we need an orange, we need a red, and all the varieties are clean. We can produce them. We just can't get them to live the next year after they're planted. And so that's what I really like about the Sombrero series. The Sombrero series is super hardy. It also has really nice branching. So you can see from that bottom picture on the right that we have a lot of flowers on a one gallon plant. Um, it has compact habit. It's about 18 inches tall. It's a zone 4A. Um, so this is, if you haven't tried the Sombrero series, this is a really good one to try. The other thing is it holds its color. So we're blooming through the summer through fall and when the color doesn't really fade out too much. 
Um, here's just all the colors up close, and I'll just note that the adobe orange and the lemon yellow are fantastic. Those are by far my favorite. Seed echinacea. Um, for several years, we've been growing and, and, and seeing in solid landscapes the powwow wildberry and powwow white, which are um, from seed. Those are very, very florist, florist, uh, high flower power. So compared to Magnus, they're a little bit more compact, better branching for container production. You can just get a plant that looks better in a one gallon container. Cheyenne Spirit Mix, that is one that I was reluctant to try it uh, because I wasn't sure how to how it would go over with a bunch of different colors in the same one gallon pot. And are people going to say, well, I only want the red or I only want the yellow. But then when I saw it in the mass planting, which is pictured here, I thought we have to do this because people are going to love it. Plus it's from seed and it's very, um, looks good in the container too. And here's just an example. I took this picture of Cheyenne Spirit right in front of the grocery store um, locally here in Kansas City. And this was grown by a greenhouse grower that ships into the grocery stores in the fall. So they had these echinaceas right next to the mums and pansies and everything else that they had out for fall. So kudos to the greenhouse grower for getting, you know, a new variety in there, getting some perennials into their fall mix and increasing their fall sales of, you know, their normal staples, pansies and mums with, with a perennial. I thought that was great. Uh, more echinaceas that we, we love because they're hardy and they're cool colors is the double scoop series. So the two pictured here are orangeberry and raspberry, and that's a zone 4A. They get a little bit taller than the sombrero series. They're like two feet to two and a half feet tall. If you go to the next slide, we have all the, the more colors up there. Um, so bubblegum is kind of a pink. Raspberry is a deeper color. Cranberry is almost a red. It's a really, really, this picture doesn't show it, but it's close to a red when I see it in production. And then not pictured, um, they also have mandarin and lemon cream. And lemon cream is like a nice light yellow. Another fall favorite is Rutabecchia, Black Eyed Susan. Uh, probably everybody's really familiar with Goldstrom, perennial plant of the year in 1999, and been one of those tried and true staples. So when we want to bring a new one um, into market, it, it can be a challenge because a lot of customers say, well, why would I ever stop using Goldstrom? And I don't think the point is to stop using Goldstrom. And uh, Goldstrom is what's pictured on the right there. You can see how, how big it gets. It gets as big as a four-year-old. Um, but it does, it does look great in the landscape. And that's a recent picture there. Uh, but on the far left is Little Gold Star. Little Gold Star is a really, um, really great new and in, newer introduction. It only gets 14 to 16 inches tall. The flower is a little bit smaller than Goldstrom. It's a two to two and a half inch flower, but you get way more blooms per plant. So from a production standpoint and in um, you know, a one gallon standpoint, the plant looks great and it ships really well. It's nice and sturdy. So it's definitely one where we still have Goldstrom and it's a great plant to use. And here's an improvement. If you want something with more that will have more flowers on it, that will be a little bit more uh, controlled in the landscape and a little bit shorter. Um, and some of the other varieties that we've experimented with, and I know there's there's tons of them, but Cherry Brandy, Henry Eilers, and uh, Little Susan, Little Susie are all very nice varieties, but by far the favorite for us is Little Gold Star. Asters are definitely, you know, still a staple in the landscape, and there's been some improved varieties on asters. Um, Walters has one called Kicking Aster, which I don't have a, a picture of, and we haven't really tried, but I've seen it, and it looks um, it looks very nice. Aster is also one that we'll always see on the native list. So um, the native aster is, is being widely used, but aster still has its place uh, for fall uh, planting. It might be a little bit more difficult in the container because of the, um, the bloom time, but in the landscape, the landscape performance of asters is excellent. So the top left is happy end. Um, and then in the, the center pictured, is Professor Kippenberg, Woods Blue and Woods Pink. So very uh, tried and true varieties. I always have a question about asters, and that is the color. Do you find that these colors work okay in fall containers, these spring heat kind of colors? I think you have a use for them. You, it's, there's so many different colors available for 
or mixing with them, that um, de definitely there's a use. Um, that is a very springy color on the happy end, in my opinion, the pink with the yellow center. Um, the Professor Kippenberg, that deep purple is a nice, nice color for fall. Yeah, purple's ideal. I like purple for fall. All right, great, thanks. Okay, okay. Salvia Lyrical Series. Um, here's another one where we have tried and true varieties that work great in the landscape. May Night is probably one of the top selling perennials uh, in, in our area. And so when I first saw Lyrical Blues, and that was up at the Ball Trial Gardens in West Chicago, I thought, well, do we really need any more different salvia? Why, you know, why do we need those? Um, and same thing when we've presented to landscape contractors, a lot of them are, a lot of contractors say, what's your, what's the new varieties? What's hot this year? What's, what's great? What's new that I could try? And on the contrast, a lot of them say, hey, May night's working great for me. Why should I change? Well, Lyrical Blues, there's definitely great reason to, to make the switch to Lyrical, Lyrical Blues. It's a zone 4A. It gets about 24 inches tall by 24 inches wide, very heat tolerant, reblooming. Uh, but what's really unique is that the calyxes are deep blue tone. So when the flowers are spent, and you can see that in the picture on the left here, it still looks like the plant is in bloom because it's purple. So you don't have that kind of like black spent flower that you just want to immediately go cut that off the plant because it doesn't look great. Um, it, it really has a, a longer, longer interest. And... Um, Pruning on these will encourage a lot more reblooming. The other thing what we've noticed from a production standpoint is a lot of times May night, we have to prune or, you know, do different, different things in production to get a really uniform looking crop. Lyrical Blues is very uniform. It's a, it's a great production plant because it grows very uniform and we don't have just blooms coming out of one side of the pot and or kind of wonky looking in the pot. It's very very standard uniform upright. Um, it comes in rose, white, and then the new one is called silver tone, which is the first bicolor blue with a silver edge. Um, sedums is obviously a fall favorite. I just pictured here autumn fire versus autumn joy because we always get people that will only use one or the other. To me, they're very, very similar. The color on the flower is a little bit different. Um, the autumn fire will bloom a little bit longer into the fall than Autumn Joy. So that was the main benefit I see to Autumn Fire. And here's, um, when I put Sedum Autumn Fire and Autumn Joy in this presentation, I remembered a project we supplied, and this was actually back in 2007. Um, they put the block building at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. And they did this incredible rooftop garden with big, massive plantings of different perennials, shrubs, grasses, and one of the mass plantings was Autumn Joy Sedum. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go get a picture of that because I'm sure it looks great. Um, and when I went up there, this is what it was. So it was kind of a sedum fail, basically overwatered sedum. So you do need to be mindful of that for if you're going to do a mass planting on sedums, make sure that the irrigation is right or you'll get this look instead of the look you want. Other sedums that we love for, for production and we like in the landscape that give a little bit new or unique look is the Sun Sparkler series. Um, Dazzleberry by, is by far the favorite. It has an eight inch raspberry flower head. Um, and, and raspberry is just a deep, deep purple raspberry color. Um, the pink stem against blue gray foliage also makes it very unique. Um, on the left picture is Lime Zinger. That's a four inch tall, basically matte. Um, of green green foliage, and it gets a little pink flower on it. Uh, cherry tart also is a pink flower, and it's a six to eight inch by 18 inch. And then at the bottom, you can see uh, a mixed tray. And mixing sedums is is a great um, you know a great look to fill in spaces in the landscape, and you have kind of a three season three season look. But for fall, you get an outstanding look when you use mixed sedums. The question uh, from Jan or Yom, uh, Jan, excuse me, uh, about the, the, are we looking at any particular series of sedums here, or are these just yes. fairly open varieties? Uh, sorry, I should have had the label there, but it's the Sun Sparkler se uh, series, and so they actually have a lot more in the series than the three I have pictured here. The three pictured are 
dazzleberry, lime, zinger, and cherry tart. Um, and there's several more. So they have a, if you Google sun sparkler sedums, you can find all of them. All right. And, and what zone? How hardy are these? These are zone four. Ooh, hardy. There you go. Okay, so other perennial favorites for fall, of course, grasses are huge for the fall. Um, pictured here, we have blue grandma grass, which is the native grass, and then the cultivar of it, which is blonde ambition. And I do note, though, that I have this switched around. So the left is blonde ambition, and the right is the straight native blue grandma. Um, both of them six to 12 inches tall. The blonde ambition is quite a statement in the fall. And honestly, I think the blue grandma is a great statement in the fall, too. Very similar. The blonde ambition, you know, has more of the of the golden seed heads uh, showing. So I think those are two great plants and natives. So wide application, great way to mix natives with cultivars here. Um, really nice plant for fall. Northwind switchgrass. This is a picture of Panicum Northwind at Longwood Gardens that I took in um, October of 2014. So this is a really upright steel blue. It's from Roy Diblick. It has thick blades, the gold yellow fall color, but um, we like it because it's very upright. You can use it in a mass planting and it looks great. You can use it as a specimen. Indian grass is a grass that we've grown for a long time, but we just grow, grew the straight species. This is another native grass that now some exciting cultivars are coming out of it. Um, Indian grass in container production really flops a lot, so it's hard to make a good presentation in a container. Sioux Blue has um, less likelihood to flop unless you really over fertilize. If you over fertilize, they're going to flop. But this is a really blue, um, kind of steel blue colored. Um, foliage three to five feet by two to three feet wide. It can tolerate clay soil, which so for us in Kansas City is a, is a big benefit. Um, but that's a great culti native, native cultivar for fall. Um, little blue stem, there's been tons of, well, several new introductions on little blue stem. I have pictured here Blaze, which is an old tried and true variety but the fall color on little blue stem is outstanding. And now you can get little blue stem that's more upright um, in ovation, in, and you can get little blue stem that's a little bit shorter. Um, there's several different varieties that we've worked with, but um, many, many different ones on the market that are all really good. Um, Prairie Munchkin, Blaze Blues, Prairie Blues, Ovation. Um, so lots of good um, options for little blue stem. And then another fall favorite for grasses, Miss Campus purpurensis, non-native, um, of course, but one of the best fall colors for a grass. You can see the mix of orange to red uh, for the fall here, plus the really nice plumes on top of it. Um, this goes by the common name flame grass. It's a zone four. Uh, it goes four to six feet tall by two feet wide. And then I just have some pictures of really nice, what I what I thought were really nice fall grass landscapes. Here's a mix of Panicum Shenandoah, so a cultivar of a native, with Hamlin, which is a non-native. Um, more native mixed with cultivars. And here we have little blue stem Hamlin and sea oats. And I think that still looks pretty nice. And then here's a native and perennial grass mix. And this is actually at a huge um, shopping and entertainment district in Kansas City that's brand new. And a lot of effort and um, uh, went into this landscape from, from growing all the perennials and native grasses for it to the install and then maintaining. And you can kind of see what it looks like right now in the fall. So it's probably not my favorite fall landscape. Um, next slide. Actually, it was um, a little a little bit so wild that they decided to rip out a lot of that at the corner. They just replaced it with a mass planting of Hamlin. So I think the thing to note there is to be real careful when with the use of mixing negatives and ornamentals together, making sure that they're not choking each other out and they're not uh, don't end up just looking like a weed patch like that last slide. And I asked Jeff to give me a picture of the bald landscape because they have probably one of the most beautiful native landscapes I've seen. And that's the picture on the left there. Um, I'm, is that a fall picture, Jeff? 
Uh, that's uh, yes, actually it is. Uh, that would well, if you squint, it's mid-August. <laughs> if you call yeah. it fall, because <laughs> the uh, alleys are fall. still flowering. Yeah. What's really nice about that landscape is that the way it was planned, it's not just a sporadic mix of okay, take 20 different varieties and mix them all up in one big area. They have a really good rhyme or reason to how they place them with the different differing heights and differing widths. Um, so you don't get like what we saw on the la the, the previous slide. Um, yeah, it's big, so it's big blocks of uh, big blocks of varieties, and there's also a bio swale in there, mm -hmm. so it's you know it's serving a, a function as well. It does look nice. Compliments of Roy Diblick who did that work from uh, North Wind Nursery in Wisconsin. Really nice, really nice. So I think the the main takeaways is that native landscapes can look great in the fall. Native landscapes, you know, native and cultivar mixed landscapes can look in, great in the fall as long as they're planned appropriately. And then here on the right is a picture of one of my favorite native fall landscapes and this is just actually at our farm where we have a native mix so to me this is a really appropriate use of just a mix of natives um, because we're not up next to a building where where we have miniature turf uh, this is at a farm and very cute kids very cute kids <laughs> yeah. but we're here to talk about plants Ooh, there were so many great perennials for the fall, it kind of makes me want to get out and uh, kind of do a little more of my own landscape. You can hook me up, guys, right? <laughs> All right. Um, you know, perennials are great, but there's nothing that says fall like a fall mum, like a garden mum, and there's nobody who talks about mums like Linda. Well, thank so, Linda, you. thank you. Take it away. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Um, let's go on. Let's talk a little bit about what makes a good landscape mum. Before we start talking about varieties, what should we be looking for in a landscape mum? Because believe it or not, not all mums are grown and chosen for landscape use. There's a lot of mums that go out to retail and they need them to flower at a certain time, have that pop of color, but they're not going to have all the same attributes that you'd want in a landscape mum. And having worked for a landscape contractor for a number of years, I know that you need to bring value to the client in order to get that renewal, in order to get them to buy into having that color installation um, in the fall, because sometimes those fall rotations are what gets cut when they're looking at the budget. Um, and if you're putting in the right mums, I think you can bring value to the client and continue to keep those contracts going or whatever customer you're working with. So with the landscape mum, we want something that's got a good habit. It's rounded, uniform shape. You don't want it to be lumpy and bumpy. Um, you want to have lots of flowers. This is something that's meant to bring color. So either large flowers or just a lot of flowers. And you want long-lasting flowers. You don't want to put something in that a week later looks like poop because that's no value. So when we're selecting mums to bring into, a, um, into our breeding program, we're looking for an attractive fade. Truth is, all flowers will fade. These aren't silk. They will fade. Um, but when they fade, we want them to still look attractive. We like to have attractive foliage. Usually a dark green is a nice um, accent to the, the flower color. Uh, certainly we want some frost tolerance in the north. But then in the south, you need to have that heat tolerance. And we test mums for flexibility. You want to be able to pick that mum up, put it on the cart, or the truck without having the branches break. But at the same time, if there's too much flexibility, it'll split open in the rain. Um, and there's a lot of improvements that have occurred in the genetics to bring forth these great attributes to mums. And down in lower right is one of our mum trials that happens to be out in New Jersey. Um, and we have two of our evaluators going through and making the selections. And they'll visit a site at least three times because they need to uh, monitor, you know, when does it bloom? How long does that flower color stay there? There was a great red mum that I saw last year. I was so excited. It was exactly the same red as a farm all tractor. And I thought, this is great. And in seven days, it was faded and brown. So it didn't, didn't make the grade. Are there mum trials in uh, New Jersey that you can visit this fall? Uh, yes, there is. There's uh, one, uh, anybody out east who purchases from Cube Pack, they have an open house. I think that's coming up September 27th. Um, 
There's uh, Lucas Greenhouses has some. There's other other places around the country. Rakers up in uh, Michigan, uh, they have an open house and they do a, a grow out of different mum varieties. Good, good. So certainly, you know, um, if you're a landscape contractor, talk to your grower about where the trials are. Certainly if you're a grower, you should be making an effort to get to some of these trials so that you're aware of the advances that are taking place because as I'm going to talk in a little bit, we can maybe make your life a little bit easier. I'll tell you what, you get me a list, I'll publish it in Acres Online, we and uh, all of you will know just where to go this fall yeah. to check out some mums. So, um, you may get some, as a contractor, you may be hearing about, oh, this variety is great, that variety is great, but then when you go to get it, it's not there. Well, the best time to book your mums isn't January, it's by January. In November, review your sites. Take a notice of what worked well, what didn't work well, um, and be aware that mum production begins the previous fall. So we're already getting ready at the production sites. They're starting to plant the stock for next year's crop. And I know many of you haven't even done your installations yet for this year. And the picture to the right is of a production house where those are harvesters going through and they're actually cutting taking cuttings from stock that will be used to produce more stock. Um, the growers get this unrooted cutting. It, uh, it's all produced in North America. Um, that's because of USDA regulations. But they'll get these unrooted cuttings um, sent to them sometime between April and June for producing the mums that you're going to want to install. So up until early February, stock producers can make adjustments to what they're doing. After that, whatever's in the ground is what's going to be produced. So if you're going to your grower and it's June or July and you start putting your mum orders, you're going to be stuck with whatever the grower has decided to bring in. And a lot of times it may be based on what they sold the year before, but otherwise you're going to be stuck with what they have and you're going to have to try and make the best use of, of those choices. So when that grower tells you they want a pre-book, it's for a very good reason because they really do want you to get what you want. Um, and the market has changed. There's very little speculation being done nowadays. That's not profitable for anybody. So the message is pre-book, pre-book, pre-book. You can always go back and tweak those orders later when the actual contracts come through. Um, most of your, if you work with a, a sales rep or a grower rep, um, they will they will work with you on those. Um, the second thing is to think about growing, choosing your grower based on quality, not price. And you're probably thinking, lady, don't you know we're talking about garden mums? This is just a commodity crop. It's you know why wouldn't I be concerned with price? Well, I understand you have budgets to work work with, but let's think about how can I get the best value on what I'm purchasing. Um, the grower or distribution rep can also guide you to the best varieties based on the site conditions. If it's shady, if it's sunny, if you've got street lights, all those factors can in influence how the mums are going to perform on the site, as well as how well your customer is going to be satisfied with what they have. So they're going to be asking you if you need early, mid-season, season extenders, and a lot of that has to do with the bloom time. Mums are a, a plant that flowers as the nights get cooler and as the days get shorter. So they need that nighttime experience in order to flower. So if you've got a lot of lights on the site, that can influence how the mums do on that site. So your grower wants to be able to work with you on that. And this picture, I mean, this is, this from a distance appeared to be a fairly attractive mum installation, but when I got up close, I realized that We've got some mums to the right that are already fading out and others that have barely even started to open. So it wasn't really the best installation that I've seen. Um, again, you, the grower wants you to be successful because they want you to come back and, and buy from them. They want that, to see you get those contracts again and again. Um, no... Be, don't be afraid to, to ask your grower or go see your grower while they're doing their production. On the left, we've got a, a really great mom 
Um, the good genetics, it has good habit, really interesting flower. These are the Avalons. Unfortunately, they didn't get quite enough feed and there was water stress early in production. Um, so even though they may have great genetics, uh, the growers got to stay on top of what they're doing. On the other hand, on the right, um, there's been some major improvements in mum genetics. The, this red one that's at the far right that's looking kind of floppy and ugly, that was sort of the standard for a red garden mum um, up until a few years ago. It required a little bit of hand holding in TLC. That bright pink, it's called grapeberry, that's sort of a new standard. That one, they stuck a single cutting in the pot, watered and fed it, and voila, it grew into this ice cream cone-like mum. And you can see when the other one was treated the same way, it just didn't perform as well. So growers, this is why you would want to get out to the trials so you can see these improvements because obviously it's going to take um, a lot less energy and resources on your part to produce a beautiful mum if you start with the right one to begin with. Here's two installations. The one on the left is a really good garden mum. Um, it was pumpkin pie. Um, however, the contractor that had this site um, is one who purchased, is known for purchasing based on price alone. Um, I'm going to guess that their buyer probably doesn't even know uh, what a garden mum looks like up close. They may be just looking at a price list and saying, okay, this guy's got the one gallon at this price and this one other one is much higher. Um, but you can see how many mums had to be installed on the left in order to get that color splash because the grower, in order to cut costs, has to uh, sometimes put the mums in on a pot tight situation. They can't space them. Think about it. The, they space them out they're getting a lot less dollar return on the square footage. They're also going to be able, they won't be able to fit as many uh, mums on the cart. Whereas the mums on the right, um, the grower works with a representative who's very insistent that they have spacing of 18 to 20 inches because she knows that her clients want to have this big rounded look. I estimate that if you had taken the mum on the right and did the install on the left, you probably could have gotten away with 30% less mums. So even though you're looking at that unit price, when you think about the end story and the client satisfaction, the picture on the right was taken at a site that, Jeff, you can confirm this, they had planned to uh, drop their color program and go to just shrubs and perennials. It's a trend that we've seen in, in a lot of landscape situations as people were looking for ways to, to trim their budget. After having this color display in the fall and getting such a positive response from their residents, this is a mixed use facility of residential and retail, um, they ended up keeping the color program. So if you want to retain those color contracts and certainly enhance your reputation, because I'll be honest, if I were a property manager or a customer looking um, to hire you to do work and somebody's portfolio is coming in with work on the right versus the one on the left, um, I, I know which way I would go. <laughs> nice. So um, there's a number of great, great mums out in the marketplace and across the, the country. Um, and I, the list could be exhaustive, but there's some that really stand out as our evaluators travel around the country. You'll walk across a field similar to the picture we had shown before, and every once in a while there's something that just stands out and you're like, wow, what is that? So I'm going to go through some of those wows right now. If you're in the Pacific Northwest um, or conditions similar to the Pacific Northwest, these are three that really stood out. Pink Frenzy, it's got this really brilliant pink color, attractive fade. Fire Glow is a relative newcomer to the market. Um, it's in its second year of commercial production. So um, we're starting to see tremendous interest in that and people are very happy with how this one's been performing. Um, Great Berry, I call Great Berry the Energizer Bunny of mums. Um, this thing just keeps on going and going and going. 
that was grape berry that we saw on the slide before. And that, slide, that picture, when I had taken it, I was a little concerned before I got to the site because we had two nights of hard frost. It had gotten down to 27 degrees, and I thought, ah, I missed the window. Things are going to look like heck. And grape berries still looked good. Um, went back and saw it two weeks later in the middle of a rainstorm, and it was still going. I actually kept started counting the days. How long would it take for this thing to get ugly? Um, and it, it was the middle to end of November when it finally was like, okay, it's time for it to be taken out and, and replaced. So that's, that's one that should be on everybody's list. In the south, um, orange zest is one that really has excellent color retention. There's a new color to the garden mum market in key lime. It's sort of a chartreuse one. May not be, it's one of those like, you know, mayonnaise and Miracle Whip. People love one and they don't love the other. Key lime is one of those that probably has some who like it, some who don't. Um, but I've also seen this used in more modern displays, a square silver container, something more upscale, uh, trying to introduce a little bit more modern look. Key lime has been um, a great success that way. And again, we've got grape berry. This is it, grape berry in Austin, Texas, just loving the heat. Up in the Northeast, fire glow has been a big hit, and plum berry. It's got this rich crimson color, great uh, color retention, uh, big, very uh, large flowers, very prolific. And in the Midwest, uh, yellow tang, I mean, it's just, a, it's a, just a strong, strong yellow, easy to grow, uh, plays well with other mums. We've got atomic orange, and of course, here's grape berry. Again, this one was taken after several hard frosts. Um, when we talk about mums, we talk about there being families. Um, so if you're familiar with the Syngenta Yoder types, they've got uh, the girls. There's the Cheryls and the Jacquelines and the Gigi's um, within ball mums. We now have um, families as well. And what's nice about families is they're almost like twins that have a different hair color. They're genetically matched, so they're going to perform very similar. They're going to flower at the same time. Their habit's going to be similar, but you got a different flower color. So when somebody's growing a combination, you're still able to get that nice, round, uniform habit that we want to see. But they also work well in the landscape because then you know that these are all going to do the same thing. If there's heat delay, like we're having this year, they'll all be delayed the same way. Um, you can count on them to work well together. I like the way these look. Now, in the spring, we call this an Easter egg mom and a pot mom. We need a fall name, <laughs> something that's the equivalent. Well, what's nice about the flamingos is that they have this color-changing quality. And oh, I don't have the slide up here. The pineapple, which is more of that yellowy color, that was actually one of the favorite mums at the Biltmore Estate because it did have this color-changing quality. And they did a mass planting of it that was just super. So. There's also the Avalons, probably the largest family. But these are later, um, mid-October. But there, are, uh, there does seem to be some growing interest in having uh, fall color into October to still be about fall when Halloween comes, even still be about fall as Thanksgiving comes. Not Imagine everybody that. is rushing into <laughs> Christmas at the same rate. And then there's the Paradiso. These are also a new introduction. If uh, you've been using the Cheryls in the landscape, these are timed just a few days off from the Cheryls. But what's nice about them is their color is a little bit more rich and intense than you find with the Cheryls. My ancestors actually came over on the Mayflower, so I'm, I'm happy to see <laughs> the fall is still, is still the fall. Yes. Well, <laughs> Linda, thanks so much for that, uh, that tour of, uh, of the mum world. You're welcome. As it, as it is today. It's You're looking welcome. beautiful. It's some great varieties. And now, last but not least, we're going to wrap up with Jeff Gibson. Roll on in here, Jeff. Get close to the mic. And uh, here it comes. You can us, hear those wheels rolling. Fill us in on uh, the world of pansies for the fall. Well, hey, Chris, what do you get when you cross a monkey <laughs> with a flower? I, I knew I should have reviewed this PowerPoint before I <laughs> before I let you wear. Uh, what do you get when you cross a monkey, monkey with, with a, a flower? flower? You get a chimpanzee. Oh. Oh. 
All right, everybody. Now, right. thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. All right. All right. Well, we're going to zip through the end here with all this, the last element of traditional fall color, which is pansies. So those of you in the south are standing right on the cusp of receiving your pansies. Some of you may have even started some installation. So there's do's and don'ts to go along the way, but there's hardly a product, a plant that doesn't serve uh, a utilitarian need in the landscape than fall pansy. So let's start with a few tips. Uh, these are some of the basics that you would want to bear in mind when you're purchasing your pansies, just exactly like what Linda was covering with mums. In this case, with pansies, your best bet is to get a pansy that's just starting to crack color. Not fully in color, but just starting to crack color, especially as those of you in the south. So proper soil and bed prep, of course, so you would have done all your fall removals, possibly placed some bulbs in there. The key thing with pansies is avoiding soil compaction, which ultimately avoids root compaction. It's critical for pansies. And this is the last three reasons why. Make sure they've been fed. Most growers will feed them. If not, if they're sitting in your yard, you want to give them a shot of some liquid fertilizer. Uh, and then water them in with clear water. So the roots are newly formed, newly planted. And so you want to wait a little bit of time before the plants are actively uptaking uh, nutrition in the soil. So it's usually good uh, to wait a week or so while the roots push out so that they, that you get the optimum performance for pansies. And Jeff, what I like about these tips is they're not only great for landscapers doing big installs, but great for growers to share with their landscape That's customers right. and for retailers to share with their end consumers for their home beds. Exactly right. I'm going to take a few of those exactly ideas. Right. So. Okay, so then uh, some other tips. Uh, these are common problems that we hear from landscapers around the country. Uh, starts with obviously identifying the right problem. So pansies, especially of those folks down in Texas, you're struggling with a great deal of rain going on right now, have been waterlogged for a long time. So root diseases will run rampant in pansy beds. The labiopsis and various forms of it, rhizox and whatnot, will affect, uh, affect pan, uh, pansies faster than anything. Most of your growers are applying fungicides before they're shipped. So be sure and check with your grower that that is the case, especially if you know that you're going into beds that have that are prone to water holding and prone to diseases. It's almost always the labiopsis that will get a pansy. And watch the watering in a bed situation like that. The second thing that we would normally see, uh, uh, typical problems, of which I kind of referenced earlier, if you want to put this slide there, Chris, uh, physical stress. Now, this, this is most prevalent in those areas where they do do overwintering of pansies. And we've got some selections to talk about there for overwintering. The most common problem for pansies is the physical stress. So it's very common with freezing and thawing in, in areas further north, north of the Mason-Dixon. That actually uh, damages the roots and makes it more difficult for the roots to take up nutrients in the spring. Frozen roots, and you see this, especially in the north, that's what really results in desiccation. So the roots are frozen. The plant can't take up moisture in the spring, you know, March, and then you start seeing the white tops. That's almost always what's going on, the desiccation of the foliage. So that's physical stress. That's quite common. The third thing is basic nutrition, if you want to flip over there. Uh, so the lack of feed on a pansy shortens the time in the bed. As I just said earlier, most of your growers are bringing the pansy to you well-fed. And if they haven't, then you're probably going to need to plan on an additional feed. So a fed plant is a healthy plant. A healthy plant can survive more diseases, especially back to the rhizoc and pythium, uh, or the, the labiopsis issue I mentioned before. So liquid feed after a week of plants, so the plant's got active root systems. Purple leaves, that's something that you typically see. That's a symptom of low phosphorus. So they're basically telling you, feed me Seymour when I'm turning purple. Here's another little tip. Uh, love to share this. This is from Dr. Will Healy. Uh, pansies are in the peas, which are low pH loving annuals. Pansies, petunias, and primulas, low pH, uh, as opposed to the high pH tolerant vimps, vinca, impatience, marigolds, and pentas. Our utilitarian plants for landscape are begonias, lantana, and zinnia, because they're smack in the middle in terms of pH need. But the pansies, Definitely a little bit on the uh, acidic side. All right, so let's rip into some of these varieties. So basically starting from small and going to large, 
uh, sorbet violas. It is one of the most overlooked classes of pansies, violas, in the United States, and they're fantastic in landscape. You're starting to see a little bit of them used in the mid-Atlantic. So they're, they're small but mighty, super cold hardy. If you're concerned about having overwintering, this is your plant. Six to eight inches on center, you get them in packs, so you can push them in there tight, and they do beautifully. So here's a couple of examples of some of the mixes that growers can provide to you. I think we've got a couple more examples that follow there. A range of colors, light colors, citrus colors, usually your yellows and the purples are the ones for fall. Here's a couple of the bed examples beyond that. Uh, fall, fall based colors, this particular selection, lemon per face, sort of gives you sort of a Halloween-y feel. So sorbets are great for the landscape in mass bed plantings. That's your 55 mile an hour color bed right there. So moving on to the next class, Panola pansy, one of our unsung heroes here at Ball, Pan American Seed. The pan as in pansy, the ola as viola, so they truly are a cross between a pansy and a viola. Medium sized, but they make up for it by being the best overwintering pansies. They are super tough. They stretch less in warm climates, which is a big deal in the south, and they bloom their heads off. And the next slides kind of show you what they can do. They're interesting mixes. This one's called, obviously, Halloween mix. Next one is a couple of other examples. The sunburst, which is kind of a mix all to itself. It's one straight color, but you get a lot of the oranges and bronze tones for fall. And the yellows, as I said, are very popular for the fall as well. Um, these canolas are great for the traditional striping or blocking and they because they're very, very uniform. And as I said earlier, they don't do the stretch that so many pansies do. So we'll move on to the next large class, which from Ball would be the Matrix Pansy. So now there's a fall version and a spring version. We're going to concentrate on the fall version at the moment. So these are pansies that have been selected to flower under long days, as in the summer. So your pansies are being grown at the exact wrong time of the year of a pansy by most growers, especially in the south. So these pansies were selected to bloom under those days and take the heat stress. Bigger bloom pansies, especially in the south, are needed because the growers are going to try and control them with plant growth regulators. So the matrix series is intentionally bred to have bigger flowers so that when PGR is applied and the blooms shrink, you still have a decent sized pansy. So that's the matrix pansies, and that's sort of become our mainstay for landscape. The next, uh, and it's a, available in a range of colors, including cleverly named ones named after jewels and whatnot. The next set actually are the types that you would typically use in the fall, your Halloweens, citrus mixed colors, uh, the tricolor mix, ocean breeze, which I think is in the next slide, Chris. A uh, couple of, well, a couple of examples of the color blocking, just like we talked about earlier with the with the panolas, the next slide I think actually shows you from scratch to ocean breeze mix, which could actually serve as a nice, especially in resort markets in the fall, that might be a nice uh, alternative for you, the ocean breeze matrix mix. So the last one I want to talk about is our cool wave, which is a really interesting plant. It hails from the viola side of things, fall or spring planted, it's in baskets and containers best. Uh, it can be used in the ground, but it's mostly known for baskets and containers. The range of colors that you see are, uh, well, sorry, uh, the reason you're growing the cool wave pansies is exactly this. It goes, spreads laterally, as opposed to more of a mounding type that the Grandiflora types have. I don't know what an ONSI is, but uh, sorry about that, Chris. <laughs> a Grandiflora ONSI. <laughs> uh, the next slide kind of tells the tale. Uh, that's where, we're gonna get, that's where we're going to get really technical. We're going to bring it into the 1940s with television. Here we're going we to play a brief video here. <laughs> so uh, let's see how this comes through for everybody. So this is showing how well they overwinter compared exactly. to other pansies. And there it goes. So regular pansies on the right, cool waves on the left. 
So that kind of tells the tale better than anything. So these are spreading type pansies, as that other slide illustrated. In a range of colors, as I indicated, as a spreading type pansies, that's why they're so prevalent in, in baskets. Here's a couple shots from the West Coast, uh, and you can see what they do. So if you're doing street baskets, urns, and municipalities, cool waves are absolutely the way to go out of a larger size pot, especially in the fall. Uh, range of colors that are coming and yet more behind. I think the next shows you some of the newer ones. The Morpho was new this year. The Red Wing and Sunshine Mix, which is a beautiful fall color combination. And again, it's sort of a singular color that actually acts like two colors, which is a bonus. And then uh, following after that, I think we, oh yes, uh, in case you were confused by all of that, uh, Pan American has endeavored to give you a poster of this. You could hang on your wall in your facility that would give you all of the range of colors of pansies that are currently available. And I even see some frizzle sizzles in there. Some frizzle sizzles, the double yeah. fringe type uh, pansies, which are quite popular in their own right. Yeah, so the last slide enough. I'd like to close with, Chris, would be some of the materials that are available to the landscape trade and the growers that sell the landscape trade. Uh, the balllandscape.com website has a ton of free downloadable presentations of new varieties. Uh, we have archived, or Ball Publishing has archived the spring seminar that we did with Chris here. And then our Thrive brochure is available online as a digital download, or we can mail you a copy old school style if you'd like. We can do it high tech or low tech high around tech here at, uh, at Ball. And this webinar will be archived, I'll tell you about that in a second. Well, Jeff, I, this is where we, we like to tackle the questions. Um, we, we covered the few that came in. There's only one more. This is from Will. He wants to know, when you were talking about pansy feed, he wants to know specifically what feed and at what rate. Are you prepared to tackle that one? Uh, yeah, or we can take it offline. Usually, as I'd indicated, uh, what's so common is they're using granular fertilizers, but realize that when you just stick a pansy in the ground, the roots aren't going to be able to take it off. In the heat of the south, if you have high heat temperatures, you're going to lose all of that granular. It'll go right through the soil, especially if you have high rains. So liquid fert is usually better. Your 10, 20, 20 is oftentimes what people are using. But getting the fert at the right time is probably almost more instrumental than actually the, you know, like the grain. That's when you're talking about in the, once it's planted yeah, so in the, the landscape. Actively, actively rooting. All right. And if, Will, if you want to know more about the greenhouse, um, well, email Jeff directly on that one. He can communicate any more specifics beyond that. And uh, Karen wants to know, can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Jeff, can you arrange that for Absolutely. Karen? Absolutely. We will post this on balllandscape.com, the PowerPoint. And as Chris alluded to earlier, it will be available as a webinar on the Ball Publishing website as well. But you may want, like, you know, an actual drawing, yeah. you know, a copy of that. He'll, he'll, he'll hook you up, Karen. He'll hook you up. Uh, if you've got more questions, you can email Jeff or Linda or Lindsay at their addresses right here. Just chat with them. They're all nice folks. So, well, uh, that's it for today's webinar. Lindsay, thanks so much for joining us from, uh, from Kansas City. It was great to have you here today. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks. And um, for, uh, for Lindsay in Kansas, for Linda and Jeff right here at Ball, and for all my peeps here who are making Grower Talks and Green Profit so I can host these webinars, I'm Chris Bates, uh from Grower Talks, Green Profit, and uh, Acres Online saying, so long, everybody. Wait, I don't want to say so long. The archive. The archive, yes. Fallpublishing.com forward slash webinars. I promised I would tell you where the archive is. It's the same place you sign up for all of our webinars. Speaking of which, I've got another one tomorrow at noon, this time talking about uh, HGTV Home Garden Collection and their relationship with EuroAmerican uh, to provide you with liners. So tune in for that one as, as well. Now, I think I've got it all covered. So. For uh, everybody here at Ball Publishing, I want to say so long, everybody.